Right now on To The Point, more money disappearing from EBT cards. People can't buy food or pay rent. That's what I depend on to survive for me and my kids every month, so it's pretty frustrating. A former college athlete speaking out against trans women in sports. The protest happening now. President Biden mourning the 18 lives lost in Lewiston, Maine, as we learn more about the shooter's mental health. Good evening, this is To The Point, I'm Alex Bell. Right now, our community's most vulnerable people are trying to figure out how to pay rent and buy food. Many stood in line today trying to get their EBT funds reimbursed. Their monthly stipends, stipends funded by our tax dollars, just disappeared. And it's a story that we've been following for months now. Our Becca Habegger here is from those trying to get answers. As people's benefits arrive in their accounts at the beginning of the month, hundreds have lined up at the Sacramento County Department of Human Assistance to report their public benefits dollars have been stolen off their EBT card. Chantelle Ariola and her two young sons are among the victims. This is the second time that it's happened to me in the last four months where somebody has skimmed my benefits. That's what I depend on to survive for me and my kids every month, so it's pretty frustrating. She said thieves took $1,000 this time within minutes of the funds becoming available. Darren Shea had $220 stolen. Yeah, yeah, it is worrisome because a lot of people rely on this stuff. And, you know, they, they don't have any other options. And like me, I, I'm waiting for a disability claim that I've been waiting on for almost four years. So um, without this money, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't be able to buy the most basic necessities. He says he puts this money toward his phone bill and rent. I would not have a place to live. So I'm actually on the brink of not having a place to live by the end of the day if I don't get the money back. Here, the county is issuing letters to landlords explaining what has happened. The state says counties which administer the benefits are actively reimbursing victims but they have up to 10 business days to do so. We're still not going to get it today. It's going to take at least two weeks. So in that two weeks, if I don't have a family member to call on, my lights are going to be off. My kids are not going to have certain things. My phone won't be on. So in case of emergency, I can't call out. County workers tell ABC 10 they've seen this consistently, but it seems to have gotten worse in the last couple of months. Some theft happens through skimming. It's where someone quickly installs a device in an existing card reader that steals information from the magnetic strip. Some thieves will install tiny cameras on ATMs to capture PIN numbers. Others will use phishing, sending out fraudulent links that look authentic, hoping someone will click on them and be tricked into sharing their information. The state recommends people using EBT cards frequently change their PIN number, especially right before they expect to receive benefits. But some victims tell us even with a new card and new PIN number, they've experienced theft and wonder how else thieves might be getting access to their money. I just really hope that they figure it out. Becca Hobbecker joins us now. Becca, what does the state have to say about all this? Now, Alex, the Department of Social Services responded to us just about an hour ago. Uh, yeah. You know, they encourage people to contact their local county office if they believe they are a victim of EBT theft. Cardholders can also contact the EBT customer service line at the number on your screen to cancel their EBT card and request a new one. The state also says they're working on chip tap technology for EBT cards and expect those to be available in the summer of 2024. Now, a new version of the EBT Edge mobile app is also expected to launch soon. That app will allow people to change PIN numbers, block transactions, freeze accounts, and order a new card. And as far as stopping theft, Alex, the department says they're working with law enforcement and say multiple investigations are ongoing. Yeah, and many of you have been reaching out to us about this issue. We will continue to cover this story as we get more informa information. Becca, thank you. All right, tonight there is some relief for those who woke up to missing direct deposits. Chase Bank support posted on X, formerly known as Twitter, saying a system issue affected some ACH debits and credits at several banks. That system is what allows banks to send electronic payments to each other. So they say those deposits are being resent and will be posted soon. Coming up later in the show, the Labor Department's October job report suggests a slowdown in hiring what it means for inflation. Now to developing news. Right now, police are looking for this man on your screen, Luis Gustavo Arroyo Lopez, considered to be armed and dangerous. He is believed to have stabbed and decapitated a female relative at her Santa Rosa home yesterday. Police believe he still might have her head with him. Investigators say he has relatives in the San Joaquin Valley area. If you have seen him, call 911. In less than 30 minutes, former college swimmer turned activist Riley Gaines is expected to speak out against trans women in sports. The decision is sparking controversy and protest. Our Garage Paul Senga is live at UC Davis tonight. 
Yeah, Alex, uh, that event, as you mentioned, starts in about 30 minutes. But within the past five minutes, things certainly got interesting as the people who are protesting, they try breaking down some of these barriers here. And that is when more police were in tactical gears were called. So luckily, nothing escalated after that. But that is what police are worried about because Riley Gaines is here. They're invited by a stu student organization on campus to come speak. So right now, things have calmed down a bit. But you can see this is the measures that are in place that UC Davis has has put in place barricades, a large police, UC Davis police security presence here all around this building. It's the UC Davis Conference Center. So right now things have sort of resumed back to normal, but right now protesters have still lurking in this area. Now, Riley Gaines has advocated against the participation of transgender women in women's sports, and that event this evening is called Protecting Women's Sports with Riley Gaines. It is hosted by the Davis College Republicans. The 30, uh, the 23 year old rather has been outspoken that biological males greater strength and endurance make competition with women unfair. So tonight she's advocating for the people who are attending her event to make sure to exercise their free speech to tell the truth and for women. Now we have heard protests was going to happen and that's exactly what happened here as of right now things have calmed down a bit but that is the reason why there's a large police presence here. UC Davis tell us they do have a safety plan in place and that they're going to make sure everyone attending the event people who are protesting they can express themselves and that no one is going to get hurt. So right now uh, things are looking good but we will see what happens into the night and we spoke to Riley Gaines just about 15 minutes ago she says she is this is not going to stop her from delivering her message and we're going to have much more from her tonight on late news tonight at 11. Alex and we know back in April Gaines was at San Francisco State and made national headlines with allegations of assault being made police are hoping to avoid anything like that in this case Garsh Paul, thank you Tonight, two adults and five children are displaced after a house fire on Scotsman Way in Rancho Cordova. Sacramento Metro Fire shared this video. You can see clouds of smoke coming from the home. Fire crews say they had to cut holes in the roof to allow the smoke and fire to escape, and no one was hurt. Two cases of dengue fever have been detected in California. In both cases, patients did not travel outside of the U.S. And officials say one person in Pasadena, another in Long Beach, are recovering. The mosquito-borne illness is rarely transmitted inside of the states. The city health department says the risk of exposure to others is low. Coming up on To The Point, as President Biden meets with families of those killed in the main shooting, we are learning new details about the shooter's mental health. And we're looking at cloud coverage rolling in right now with increasing clouds in the morning. What we can expect for your weekend ahead. And later in the show, we hit the back roads and head to one of California's last steam-powered sawmills. America was growing you know, after the uh, San Francisco earthquake 1906. Uh, huge demand to rebuild San Francisco and the, and the surrounding areas. Right now, an expected 200,000 people are headed to Yuba City for the annual Sikh Festival. Organizers say it is the largest event outside of India, and the event kicks off tonight with a fireworks show and ends on Sunday with a parade. And it looks like it's going to be a pretty good weekend, Carly. Yeah, it's going to be a nice night. Hopefully we can get those fireworks off before all the cloud coverage begins rolling in because we're starting to see it right now. We're going to get a mix of sun and clouds for the weekend, but increasing cloud coverage that arrives overnight into tomorrow morning. We'll get a break up here and there, but otherwise we'll continue to see those clouds becoming mostly cloudy by Sunday. But temperatures will be nice right around those mid 70s to low 70s on Sunday. Rain is mostly, I say mostly expected on Monday because our slight chance for showers on Sunday remains much further north of Sacramento. If you get a couple sprinkles here and there, it's not washing out a big event. What we're seeing, though, is that rain on Monday could linger into Tuesday. Daylight saving time, that does end on Sunday. Keep that in mind. We're rolling our uh, clocks back there. High pressure shifts toward the east. Low pressure arrives again with the cloud coverage rolling in. Then we'll start seeing those rain chances arriving about 1.30 p.m. on Sunday. Notice it's north of Sacramento, Orville, Redding, Fort Bragg, and you're seeing that along the coastline. By Monday, 2 a.m., this is when we start seeing a lot of that rain pushing into the Central Valley and those foothill spots. By lunchtime, almost everybody's starting to see some of that rain. And then into the evening, we could even see a light dusting of snow in the Sierra above 7,400 feet. Mix of sun and clouds through next week with the best shot for rain once again the following Friday 
We'll see anywhere from a tenth to maybe a quarter inch of rain if we're lucky. Daylight saving, that does come to an end, and we are rolling our clocks back on Sunday at 2 a.m., making it 1 a.m. This is a good time. Test those smoke alarms there, and then also that extra hour of sleep. Sun sets an hour earlier, so we're looking at 6.37 a.m., the sunrise. Temperatures will drop into those mid to low 60s next week, Alex. Next on To The Point, can psychedelics improve your mental health? The benefits being researched right now. I think the future is bright in terms of the ability for psychedelics to be used to treat a host of mental health conditions. We turn now to Lewiston, Maine tonight, where President Biden and First Lady Dr. Jill Biden visited with first responders and victims' families in last week's mass shooting. 18 people were killed and 13 others injured. Rena Roy has more as the president addresses gun violence in our country. President Biden and First Lady Dr. Jill Biden once again visiting a community rattled by a mass shooting, meeting with first responders and victims' families in Lewiston, Maine. Jill and I are here, though, on behalf of the American people to grieve with you and to make sure you know that you're not alone. People there are still reeling after 18 were killed and 13 others injured when authorities say Army reservist Robert Card opened fire at a bowling alley and nearby restaurant last week. The president renewing calls for gun reform in the U.S. This is about common sense, reasonable, and responsible measures to protect our children our families, our communities. Meanwhile, the first of the victims are being laid to rest today, including Trisha Aslin and Richard Marin, as we learn more about the suspects' reported mental health struggles. ABC News obtaining law enforcement documents that show a series of panicked text messages from a fellow Army reservist, warning their training supervisor back in September that Card posed a threat to the unit and other places and refused to get help. Months ago, Card's family already had concerns about his mental health and access to firearms, reporting their growing worry to authorities in May, according to a police incident report. Sources tell ABC Card also spent two weeks at a mental health facility over the summer. We looked at uh, what was uh, done as it aligns with our policy. I think we need to look at it. I think we need to, to say... Um, is there other, um, other ways to approach these situations? The governor of Maine is forming an independent commission to investigate how the multiple red flags about Card and his reported mental health history were missed. They are also examining the police response. In your price points today, the October jobs report is signaling a slowdown in hiring. The Labor Department says the U.S. economy added 150,000 jobs last month. And economists say strikes across different industries, including the United Auto Worker strike, which ended earlier this week, likely contributed to the lower job growth. Inflation has moderated since the middle of last year, but a few months of good data are only the beginning of what it will take to build confidence that inflation is moving down sustainably toward our goal. Fed Chair Jerome Powell has expressed optimism that inflation will continue to lower, potentially eliminating the need for additional rate hikes. A California jury has ruled that a clothing company should pay more than a million dollars for causing health issues. The company Twin Hill Acquisition Co. will be required to pay four flight attendants who say that chemicals used in the production of their uniforms caused rashes, headaches, and even breathing problems. Lawyers say this verdict is just the beginning as more than 400 other flight attendants are making the same claims. Can psychedelics like magic mushrooms safely improve your mental health? Preliminary studies suggest it may help relieve PTSD and anxiety. Some cities across the country have even taken steps to decriminalize its use. But researchers say there are risks to consider along with potential benefits. Since the 1500s, scientists believe humans have been experimenting with a compound in the drug called psilocybin, which, once ingested, can cause a euphoric feeling and hallucinations. But as a mental health treatment, many doctors say more research is needed to answer questions like how much is safe to consume and by whom before widespread prescribed treatment. Even though psilocybin and psychedelics have been around for decades, there tends to be this debate right now about whether or not the recreational use is so risky that we can't look further into 
the potential treatments, especially for mental health conditions. ABC News contributor Dr. Alok Patel says more than 150 clinical trials are looking at psychedelics as a treatment option for people who suffer from PTSD, depression, eating disorders, opioid addiction, and anxiety. And so far, some studies seem promising. But Dr. Patel warns there are safety risks when using psychedelics that could even worsen a person's medical condition. And the risks can even be greater if used outside of a controlled research environment. They could feel something such as nausea, dizziness, headache, vomiting. Some people experience paranoia, disorientation. And some individuals who have certain underlying medical conditions could actually see an exacerbation of that, such as an increased heart rate, hypertension. Right now, Oregon and Colorado are the only states to legalize magic mushrooms, with several cities across the country opting to decriminalize some psychedelics. The drug is still illegal under federal law. And just last month, Governor Newsom vetoed a bill aimed at decriminalizing the possession and personal use of several hallucinogens, including psychedelic mushrooms. In his veto, the governor says that he wants to see treatment guidelines set before approving it. And right now, natural psychedelics that come from plants and fungi are decriminalized in Oakland, San Francisco, Santa Cruz, and Berkeley. Next, on to the point, we head to one of California's last steam-powered sawmills. Every Friday, our John Bartell takes us on the back roads. Tonight, we head to Sonoma County to experience life as a worker in a steam-powered sawmill. If you lived in Sebastopol prior to 1964, the sound of a steam whistle would have been a familiar noise. They bring the bell at the whistle at uh, 8 in the morning, 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock, and 5 o'clock. That steam whistle noise came from Sturgeon's steam-powered sawmill, one of just a few working steam mills in California. What is going, is something on fire back here? What, what are we looking that, at that, That's just the steam, the exhaust from the steam engines. These days, the whistle blows just a few times a year during the open house events, but Tom Schaefer can still remember when he ran through the white puffy steam. When I was young, I used to play in the steam, and my mom would get so mad because they actually inject oil into the steam to, for lubrication, and of course my clothes were ruined. And Playing in the steam is still frowned upon today, but you can still visit and watch the lost art of steam milling. It's all mechanical and manual labor here. Absolutely, there's no, there's no computers, there's no hydraulics, any of that. Tom's great-grandfather, Wade Sturgeon, built the sawmill back in 1914. According to Tom, it was kind of an act of rebellion for his great-grandfather. He worked in sawmills as a young man and uh, wasn't making any money working for somebody, so he had, he says, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do my own. Building a sawmill wasn't easy back then. Tom's great-grandfather borrowed and bought a lot of used equipment. In the beginning, logs were cut with steam, but the trees were carried by hand and with horses. But the business was booming. America was growing. You know, After the uh, San Francisco earthquake, 1906, a uh, huge demand to rebuild San Francisco and the, and the surrounding areas. Giant redwood was the lumber of choice, and as demand grew, so did the mill. The horses were replaced by mechanically powered winches called steam donkeys, and more than five steam engines were added to help with production. Getting an up-close look at these archaic machines is quite a sight. Everything here is over 100 years old. It's got to take a tremendous amount of maintenance to keep these things going. The, the engines themselves are pretty simple. Um, grease and oil is the secret to making them last. At its peak, Sturgeon Sawmill produced more than 15,000 board feet of lumber a day with a 10-man crew. That may sound like a lot, but it wasn't enough to keep up with the newer gas or electric-powered sawmills. When the mill shut down, more efficient mills were being built. This one made lots of sawdust and lots of waste. The mill closed in 1964, but in 1992, the Sturgeon family and a group of former workers regained interest in the steam mill and then decided to restore it so younger generations could get a hands-on experience on running the mill. There we go. Did I just get hired on accident? Today, more than 60 volunteers donate their time to run the mill. Even logs are donated from people who lost redwood trees during storm damage. And we have a program where if you have redwood logs on your property and you get them to us, then you get half the lumber. We can, we'll cut what, whatever you want. The old steam whistle may not blow daily, but when it does, it sure brings back memories of a more simplistic time.
From Surgeon's Sawmill in Sebastopol, I'm John Bartell. Hope to see you on the back roads. If you got something in your town that would be a great road trip destination, make sure you let John know about it. You can text us at 916-321-3310. Thank you so much for joining us on To The Point. We are always working to bring you more context and information to issues impacting us here in Northern California. So if there is something that you care about or you just want more information on, reach out to me and the team. I'll see you later. Have a great weekend. Hey, it's Alex. Just wanted to say thank you so much for watching. I really love hearing from everyone and I hope that you'll stay in touch. Reach out to me on Facebook at Alex Bell TV, or you can email me at to the point at abc10.com or you can even send me a text message at 916-321-3310.